If you don't know me, I'm Jorgen Stadje, technical journalist of 28 years back. I have written some 1500 techie articles on all subjects you could wish for, and I intend to continue doing that. Um, let's see if it's the space bar. Yes. <coughs> Silicon carbide, the new hot semiconductor, which you will probably encounter in one way or the other, perhaps when flying a jet airliner. <coughs> this is what it's all about. Electronics so hot that it would melt soldering tin. But this picture is a bit of a fake. I did it by combining a visible and an infrared image. The whole thing actually glows cherry red. Can you imagine that? Electronics working while glowing. The slightly darker square is an. I thought you were good at this. <laughs> now then, okay. <clears throat> the slightly darker square, if you can see it in the middle of the, the, the red hot plate, is an operat operational amplifier chip. It works as a charm at 400 degrees and even better at 500 degrees. Silicon carbide works, looks and smells like ordinary silicon, only better. Um, <coughs> we need processors. Uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm is on its way to make processors, camera arrays, transmitters, amplifiers, <laughs> That work at 500 degrees Celsius, preparing for a Venus lander. Uh, some extreme Swedish space technology. Swedes are quite good at traveling around in space. The Institute of Space Physics in Uppsala has made various instruments for spaceships like the Rosetta, the Mars Express, Venus Express, Cassini, the Huygens mi mission to Saturn, etc., and the Bepi Colombo on its way to Mercury. We've been around in the solar system, but wait, there's more. <coughs> okay, we intend to be working on Venus. The Royal Technical Institute is actually planning one or several Venus landers. And Venus is hot. Okay, it's not a nice place. Um, <coughs> the surface is 460 degrees uh, and Rather than bringing a refrigerator onto the Venus surface, like the Russians did, uh, why, not let the, why not let the environment come on in? It's um, okay, the electronics can take it, no problems. Um, the atmosphere happens to be mostly carbon dioxide and it's not harmful. Okay, let it come in, let's accept that. The, the bowl-shaped the, the bowl object at the bottom of this image is um, a cutaway view of a Venus lander I thought out for the KTH Venus group. It must be able to stand and work and communicate and survive at the extreme temperatures and pressures at the Venus surface. But that's easy. The problem is getting it there, which we left for Christer Fugel Sanctifix. What you need is spaceship on a chip. Um, having a lot of cabling at 500 degrees is cumbersome. It's, it's problems. Copper can take it, but it's, it's problems. So most of the spaceship's brain should be fitted onto one chip, like a typical enamel tile that you have in the kitchen. Although it's made out of aluminum nitride. It's strong, it's strong enough to withstand all the bumps of space travel and has the same thermal expansion rate as silicon carbide, so the chips won't pop off when the temperatures go off. <coughs> you could even make a small asynchronous motor, flat as a pancake, that will work at 500 degrees and that will be needed for spinning the mirror around so you can make panoramic images. Mm, it's going to be nice. <coughs> but there, here on Earth, there are lots of hostile environments for electronics. Consider this gas turbine made by Siemens Industrial Turbo Machinery in Finspång. Um, 
it started off as a Swedish company, but now it's a Siemens company. Okay, it outputs 30 megawatts of power um, for power generation. Um, fine, but it's hot inside. Anyway, you have to report temperatures, accelerations, vibrations, and stuff in there um, with electronics. And you have to get the data out of there. And it's a bit complex, but you can do it. 400 degrees, okay, we know we can do 400 degrees. <coughs> Problem is the acceleration. The acceleration of a spinning turbine is something like 20,000 Gs. And that's being shot out of a cannon. Okay, let's explain the hostilities. Inside there, there's 30 megawatts of heat. Most of it doesn't actually hit this microchips, but it, it's around there, and it's bloody hot. Um, <coughs> a, gas a gas turbine is a gas burner that is six meters long and accelerates gases up to supersonic speeds. The burners are 1300 degrees and clad with ceramics, so not to disintegrate straight away. The gas temperature has fallen to some 800 degrees when it hits the turbine blades. That has to be verified by sensors. Fortunately, the sensor temper or the temperature of the electronics is a more mere 400 degrees at the turbine center. <coughs> uh, so that's where you put the electronics. But somehow telemetry must go out of this red hot inferno. So how do you do that? The circuit package looks nice, blue and gold in this picture. Uh, but when it's working, it's glowing red hot. <coughs> All the, bo the bond wires that connect transistors to the circuit board are supported in the middle to prevent the wires from breaking or flying away at 20,000 Gs. Actually, electronics are frequently being shot out of howitzers and anti-aircraft guns. The Swedish arms manufacturer Bofors makes two kinds of electronic grenades. One is the Excalibur, which uses GPS navigation. It is shot out of a howitzer, and when it reaches the top of its trajectory, it extends fins and navigates through its target. <coughs> In this way, it can be fired more or, less <coughs> more or less at the target, and then maneuver to hit with 10 meter accuracy after traveling 50 kilometers. That's like shooting from here to Uppsala. The other one is the 3P grenade, pre-fragmented programmable proximity fused ammunition. The grenade can be programmed to explode at impact or at radar contact. They have actually fitted a Doppler radar inside the grenade, a radar that survives 20,000 G plus acceleration. That's electronics. But we're in for another revolution, a civilian one. <coughs> Uh, when you stick a gas turbine on an aeroplane, it's called a jet engine. Jets have been used many years without any possibility of extracting real-time data and getting it to the ground in real time. Instead, planes have been standing in hangars for frequent maintenance. It's expensive but necessary. An engine breakdown during flight would be much more expensive it would seem better to transmit telemetry data from all the engines in the fleet in real time rather than waiting for the plane to land or break down and try to understand the fault afterwards. Also, the new green fuels will need more management. <coughs> One jet airliner will create some 25 megabytes of compressed data per day that will result in some 3.8 terabytes per day from all the world's jetliners. It also translates to a steady 44.5 megabytes per second data stream that some communication satellites must continuously convey from the aircraft to the ground. Top this off with the supercomputer data mining needed to extract some significance out of the massive amount of collected data in real time. But stay cool, it will be profitable. Airline tickets will be cheaper. And now, some of the biggest switching power supplies of our time, and they're Swedish. <coughs> Look at the ESS, the, the um, European Spallation Source. 
in southern Sweden near the university city of Lund, buried in the rich soil of Skåne, will be the most powerful neutral gun ever been built. Yes, finally Sweden will have something that is the biggest in the world. The ESS is the European spallation source which will be up and running in 2020. Problem is, <coughs> its transmitters are going to draw some 115 megawatts of pulses in 14 hertz. To not have the whole city of Lund blinking constantly at 14 hertz, the energy is stored in some really big capacitor banks, supplied by the most powerful switching supplier in history, even stronger than the one at CERN in Switzerland. Yes, they're big. Oh, they're big. <coughs> the man in the picture at the bottom left is the project leader for the switching power supplies, and the power is off, so he's not dead. <coughs> he is standing beside an 11 megawatt prototype. The blue thing in the background is the production model from CERN. The Swedish one is more powerful and much more efficient. <coughs> it will be supplying 110 kilowatt, kilovolt um, to the transmitters, and there are a lot of transmitters in there. Right, there's one of them. <coughs> Sweden is a forward nation when it comes to railways. <coughs> Sweden was the first country ever to use electrified railways. This happened during the Second World War when coal became scarce. Sweden does not have coal and Swedish exports of iron became de dependent on the price of coal uh, for running steam locomotives. In stepped the Swedish manufacturer ASEA and electrified the export route, the Malmbanan railway line in northern Sweden. So we have some tradition in the field. The first ever Tyristor controlled railway engine, the RC locomotive, was made by ASEA starting in 1967. Some 366 of them were made, <coughs> and it was an instant export success. Now the modern X55 train is finalized in Westeros, where the switch gear and traction motors are mounted, and they are big. They're really, really big. <coughs> um, the switch gear is made by Bombardier Mitrak Power Line, Power Lab in Westeros, which is a descendant of ASEA, or ABB, as it's called nowadays. I've been there, sat in the driver's seat. Yes, it's nice. <coughs> so, silicon carbide is nothing less than a revolution for high power, high temperature electronics. It can do things that silicon can't, or at least a lot cheaper than silicon. Transistors that withstand some 30 kilovolts, will undoubtedly revolutionize all sorts of power conversion, useful, for example, in electri electric power export and import. If we look away from the extremes, silicon carbide is also rad hard, so it can be used in space, which man, where <coughs> places where man dare not go, because he'd be dead right away. Right. <coughs> now for an encore. I'm speeding things up here. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about content delivery now. Content delivery to you. We were facing some time bandits. <clears throat> Let's talk a bit about techie news and some stuff that I've done. Sweden's real time, as we heard earlier yesterday, was facing a breakdown because of insufficient computing power insufficient network spe speeds, insufficient atomic clocks, and computers falling apart in general. Some clever people at Netnode understand, understood this and started the NTP project. <coughs> Sweden needed traceable real time. It was <coughs> time for a change, a new specification for a new system capable of standing the toughest DDoS attacks on the new fast networks, face fake time insertion, and most of all, to keep Sweden running in times of strife and isolation from the world around. If we no longer were able to contact the Bureau of Time and Measurements in Paris, we would need our own supply of proper time and frequency. A misalignment of a few microseconds 
might invalidate a million credit card transactions. Someone inserting fake time on the Swedish internet could seriously damage our industry and communications. So Netnode, Sunet, and me decided to do something about it, and we went to the United States to talk to some experts. I wrote the specification, Sunet built it, PTS paid for it, and Netnode now runs it. We have time. If you haven't noticed, I have written a few articles for Sunet's Fiber Fever blog on <coughs> how to build, design, maintain optical networks. <clears throat> the, the blog explains most of the mysteries around optical networks, the magic, the snags, the wonderful optical components, and how to plan and build a countrywide network with as little effort as possible, getting it right the first time. <clears throat> most network operators won't tell you about their inner workings, load figures and numbers, equipment sources and problems, where as soon as it's completely open. I'm very happy to have been able to document the whole thing and having professors at various universities explaining the inner workings of microscopic optical components. All this I have brought to my readers in the hope that they will understand the wonder of optical networking. <coughs> and the praise is coming in. Now special for you. I thought you might like this. <coughs> Uh, now let's talk about some stuff I will do for you, and you're going to love it. Everyone has problems pushing, p publishing deep techy news these days, and I will change that. My intention is to take your techy news and explain them in a pedagogic way so that most people will find them amusing and amazing and have them for a bedtime read. Long reads about complicated subjects is my speciality. The internet is full of short snippets. You can have them for free. Look at them, laugh at them, and forget them. But you will have gained nothing. No knowledge, no technology. S now, news items shorter than 140 words <coughs> have been found incapable of conveying any meaningful information. My solution is quality. The technicality at their website will not use advertisements as people hate them and will block them anyway. <coughs> You're free to use an ad blocker, it will sit idle. A test version is <coughs> or will be available at technicalitheater.se. Also, the technicalitheater mag is still available at Netnode's web server or yes. An early paper version with the same name, full of my articles, is still available at Netnode's website. The URL is at the bottom of this slide. It would give you some idea of how, how I'm working and thinking. Download all the hundreds of pages and have a good long read. <coughs> you know me. So what can I do for you? Would you like to publish with someone who thinks your techie news, white papers and press releases are more important than just a short 200 word snippet that no one will remember? Of course, we will be on the Facebook and all the other social media that you can't get around these days. So what can I do? <coughs> My motto is all the fun technological stuff is not from California. Some of it is actually made in Sweden. Now let's hope this link works. Do you think it works? Didn't work? Well, there was a link. Uh, I don't know. Ah, it was a fun link. I can't show it to you. It, it, I promise you it was fun. <coughs> anyway, so hmm, being without that link, these are propaganda. My cards about this, <coughs> about my website, and you can take them and you can drop your own card in exchange, and I will nag you when the site is actually online. Okay, I'll put them here. Okay, questions? Uh, 
Or are you just tired and want to go home? Any questions for Jürgen? Um. Yes. Okay, then if there are no further questions, uh, please join me in thanking Jürgen for a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much, Jürgen. <laughs> <laughs>